we were going through this, this series on the armor of God. And I want to wrap it up today. I want to uh, close everything out. But Ephesians chapter 6 is where we've been reading from. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, starting verse 10. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Having fastened on the belt of truth. You know, I believe one of the greatest miracles that God does is not healing the sick. I don't believe that one of the greatest miracles of God is when he opens blind eyes. I don't believe that the greatest miracle of God is when he takes somebody who is crippled and stuck in a wheelchair and he allows them to get out of that wheelchair and heals their legs and and allows them to walk. I don't believe that is one of the greatest miracles of God. I believe one of the greatest miracles of God is when an individual experiences real life change. I believe that's the greatest miracle of God. It's when somebody who struggles with selfishness becomes selfless. It's when somebody who struggles with being proud becomes humble. It's when somebody who's timid becomes brave. It's when the addicted person all of the sudden has the courage, the strength, and the ability to say no. It's when the hot-tempered becomes gentle. I believe that's the greatest miracle of God. It's when sexual immorality, when impurity, when sensuality, when idolatry, when sorcery, when enmity, when strife, when jealousy, when fits of anger, when division, when envy and drunkenness in your life begin to lose and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control begin to win. Those are the greatest miracles of God. You see, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And he goes on to tell us that we are in a battle. And it's not a battle against flesh and blood. It's not a battle where I'm battling against you and you're battling against me. He says there is a spiritual battle that is taking place in our lives. And we are in this battle. And it's a battle between good and evil. And Paul gives us this mental picture of a Roman soldier as he begins to describe the armor of God that we are to put on every single day. And it's interesting. Why did Paul use the armor as the illustration? Perhaps it's because when he's writing these letters, he is in prison. Or he is in chains. And every single day he's watching these Roman soldiers who are guarding him because Paul had some of the biggest, strongest, best Roman soldiers guarding him. Because Christians had this reputation that when you would lock them up, when you would put them in prison, when you put chains around them, all of the sudden in the middle of the night when they were singing songs, the chains would break, the doors would open, and they would break free. And so Rome said, we cannot have that with Paul. We have to give him the biggest and the strongest Roman soldiers. And so they came equipped to guard Paul in all of their gear. And Paul describes for us that we are to put on the full armor of God. And then he describes the armor. And in verse 13, I'm going to read this one more time. And I want you to listen carefully. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day 
and having done all, to stand firm. You know, we live in an evil day. We live in evil days. Just thinking of the tragedy this weekend. The tragedy in Virginia, how can there be so much evil? I think of what took place there and how can a nation, how can a nation come so far, come so far and still have so much hate? How come there is still so much racism in America? How come we live with all of this hate It's because we live in evil days. And I came up with a word. It's not a new word. Tragic. There's no other word for the hate that is openly and publicly shown toward human life. It's simply tragic. And you don't have to watch your national news to find evil. All you have to do is go to your favorite social media page, Begin to scroll down that page and what you will find is all sorts of evil. All sorts of what the Bible calls sin. And I want you to understand something. Because we are human and because of our sinful heart and because of the human heart, we will all be drawn to some sort of evil. As we come across a page, whether it's impure, whether it's hate, whether it's crime, there is something in your heart that will be drawn towards it, something in your heart that will be attracted to it. Whether it's as big as a crime or whether it's as bad as racism or whether it's as simple as gossip, your heart will be drawn into it. You will get sucked into it. You will say, yes, I agree with that. And your heart is drawn to it because Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The heart, your heart, my heart is deceitful. The things in our heart, they trick us because we're all born with this sinful nature. We're all born with this sinful desire that draws us, that attracts us to some form of evil. Maybe your evil isn't as bad as somebody else's evil, but we all know in our dark closets of our lives, there is this sense, this attraction to evil, things that the Bible would call sin. You know, I... I, I've heard this statement so many times. You've heard it. We've heard it in the news. You've heard it as they describe uh, um, a lot of different issues. But I've heard it said to my face. People have said to me, Pastor Rob, I'm struggling with this thing. I'm dealing with this thing. And Pastor Rob, I just feel like I was born this way. Pastor Rob, I was born this way. And you know what? That person expects me to sit down and all of a sudden begin to describe to them why they were not born that way. But to their shock, I look at them and I say, perhaps you were. (laughs) And they look at me like, I was not born that way. You know, you can't say that you're a pastor. And even if I was born this way, you shouldn't have answered that way. (laughs) But my response is to them, you know what? When I was born, I was born with all kinds of deceitful desires too. I was born, my desire is not the same as yours, but I had these deceitful desires that when my mom said, don't take the candy, I took the candy. Because I had a desire in my heart to disobey. I wanted something. And I had other deceitful desires in my heart that, that, that were what the Bible calls sin. And I would say, where did this come from? How did I get this? As I watch my kids grow up and they're not exposed to certain things that the Bible would call sin, but they naturally do it. I ask myself, how did they get that way? What happened to them? I never taught them that. They never saw that. We kept them in a bubble. How did they do that? How'd they learn to lie? I don't get it. Maybe they were born that way. And that there is some truth to that. That we were born this way because the Bible says because of Adam and Eve's sin, we are all born with a sinful nature. But I don't stop the conversation there with people. I say, maybe you were born that way. 
But here's the facts. When we gave our lives to Jesus, the Bible tells us very clearly that we are born again. That the old is gone and the new has come. So whether I was born one way in the flesh, I am now born again in the spirit. I'm born new, brand new. And because I'm born new and in this new way, I now have a responsibility to Jesus. I now have a responsibility to my king. I now have a responsibility to my heavenly father to live like a child of God. And so what I feel like might be right, and I might have been born this way physically, I now say I am now born this way spiritually and I must come in alignment with my King Jesus. And I make a choice to say I'm born fresh, I'm born new. You see, we struggle with that. Some some of you would take offense at that because you automatically go to the issue of homosexuality. But how come you always go there? What about lies? What about cheating? What about your smoking habit? Were you born that way? You were drawn to it. You had a desire for it. You wanted it. You longed for it. It's not of God. But yet you say, I'm this way. This is who I am. This is who I am. You see it? We're so quick to judge others with their habits and their things and their struggles and their difficulties and the very thing in their heart that has deceived them and drawn them that we, 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 we want to pull the plank out of their eye. And we got a bigger one in ours or just the same, or, or maybe it's a sliver, but we got to get it out of our eye. Let's worry about our thing and become new, become new in ourselves so that we can help them In their battle, Paul says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Withstand. You know, he doesn't say give in. He never says that. He always says, if we do fail, God is faithful and just to forgive us. But he never says just give in, just go ahead and do it. God made a way for you so that you can just go ahead and give in. He says, withstand. I love that word withstand. It means a strong, it means to strongly resist something. To strongly resist. It means to remain unaffected or undamaged by something. Don't misunderstand that, that what Jesus did for us on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross for us, it wasn't just for our salvation. It wasn't just for our uh, forgiveness of sins. It wasn't so we could stand with our sin before God. He died so that we will be washed of our past sin and be able to withstand future sin. We withstand. And Paul says, having done all to stand firm. You know, I I was told, and probably with my comments earlier, I was told that I'm meddling a little too much with this series. We like to, you know, talk about God. Let's, Let's let the Holy Spirit deal with our hearts. And so let me encourage you today. We serve a God who is so merciful. We serve a God that is full of mercy and grace. We serve a God who is there for you today to forgive you. We serve a God who loves you like crazy. We serve a God who will never stop pursuing you no matter how far you are in your sin. Whether you realize it or not, he will never stop pursuing you. We serve a God who loves you like crazy. And so I'm not trying to meddle in your business. That's for, I got my own business that the Lord's meddling in. But he wants, he, he's here to forgive you. And he's here to stand with you because he not only wants to forgive you, but God is a God who has given us tools to equip us to stand against sin. He has given us tools to stand against the attacks of the enemy that come through sin. And the very first piece of equipment in the armor of God and the last piece of equipment that I'm going to talk about in this series is where Paul says, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt is an essential piece of a man's wardrobe. Would you agree? It's essential that we keep our pants up. 
And this was especially true when describing a Roman soldier's army. The, the belt was the first piece they believed that the Roman soldier would put on. After he put on his clothes, the first piece of armor that he would put on was the belt. It's believed that he would use the belt to not just uh, uh, hold pieces of equipment for his armor, but he would also wrap some of his cloak in the belt so that it was tight, so it wasn't hanging down, so it wouldn't trip him up when he had to run or trip him when he was having to maneuver in battle. And, and so he would use the butt belt to hold up his his clothing. It also used the belt to hold his sword. We are told in Ephesians 6, uh, um, I think it's verse 17, to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That, that goes on the belt. It's the Word, and there's a reason why the sword goes on the, uh, on the belt. It's because we know that Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. We also know in John, it tells us that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. So the truth and the word go together because they're both Jesus. They're both Jesus that we fasten, we take, and we put around our lives. And it's interesting that the bell goes at the very center of the body. Because Jesus needs to be the center of of everything. Jesus holds the rest of the armor together. Jesus is the center of our life. Without Jesus, everything else, the faith, the helmet, everything falls apart. It's Jesus. Listen to Ephesians, and I'm going to give you a lot of scripture here, and then we're going to close out with it being illustrated through the, the disciples. Ephesians 4, 17. It says, now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do. Speak, he's speaking to believers. You must no longer walk as Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. You see, Jesus is the truth that leads us. If we will allow him to, he will, through the word and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, he will lead us from a former life to a, into a new life. And that new life is not when you get to heaven. When you take Jesus, you strap him to the center of your life, living by his word, you begin to discover a new way of living. I want you to jump in your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus is preaching, he is teaching to some Jews. And it says this in verse 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said to some Jews who have believed in him. That's important. Don't miss that. They believed in Jesus. There's a lot of believers in Jesus. A lot of people would fill out a survey and say, yes, I am a Christian. Why would you say that? Because I believe. And he said this, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. The truth. Who's the truth? Jesus is the truth. And the truth will set you free. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the word. If you abide in me, if you're truly my disciples, you will abide in the truth, in the word of God, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham. And have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? It's just like good Christian Americans. I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But Jesus better not tell me what I can and can't do. 
I'm an American. I'm free to do what I want to do. It's a free country. Jesus, didn't you see where I was born? Didn't you see where I got citizenship? Didn't you see why I came here? This is America. Christians in America sound just like the Jews of Jesus' day. We believe, but don't tell us what to do. We're not enslaved to anybody. And Jesus answered them in verse 34. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. You say, I'm forgiven. Yeah, you're forgiven, but you're still a slave. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We love songs about that. Woo, makes me dance. Free indeed. But then he says, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words finds no place in you. How can we leave that out of the songs? The part about, you know, we like to sing about the part to be set free, but what about the part don't kill Jesus? Or the part that be sure that his word is in you part. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer today. I'm just trying to apply word to my life today and to yours. And the reason I say this is because Jesus was speaking to Jews who believed in him. And he said to them, it's possible that you can believe in me and still seek to kill God's word in your life. You can believe in Jesus and still because our hearts deceive us, we can seek to kill the work of God in our daily life. Because we're deceived. Our hearts are deceived. James 1, 20 through 22 says this. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I like that he says that, the implanted word. You know, uh, I remember in children's ministry, you know, they would use the Bible like a sword. Like you got to, every day you got to lift up your sword. And I think in our hearts and sometimes in our minds, we think I'm just going to use this to defend myself against the enemy. And, and, and to be honest with you, the devil's just like, that's a nice book. <laughs> and you're shoving in my face. I know what's in that book. But the only way this becomes the thing that saves our souls is when this gets into our hearts. And when it gets into our hearts and it becomes actions with our words, with our hands, with our lifestyles, that's when we begin to push back the enemy. That's when it becomes effective. That's when it becomes the two-edged sword. Is when it becomes used by the believer. He says, "Do," and then he says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. It's the word. It's the truth. When it's fastened like a belt around the center of your life, that's when the greatest miracles begin to take place in a person's life because that's when real life change starts. A lot of people come to Jesus and they really sincerely want their life to be better. They come to Jesus, they come to a service, they sense the presence of God, they've come to church because they want their life to be better, they know that Jesus is the answer. Didn't you come to Jesus with hopes that your life would be better? I know I did. I know I often come to Jesus still today because I hope my life will be better. The people that will come to Jesus hoping that I will have more self-control because of Jesus, hoping that they would be more patient, hoping that they would have better relationships, hoping that they would treat their bodies better, hoping that they would enjoy more of life. But then something happens over a period of time. People come to us and they say, Pastor, why is life still so difficult? Why can I get past this sin? Why can't I get past this temptation? 
Why is this struggle still taking place? Why is this thing from my past still having victory over me and me not having victory over it? Pastor, I can't seem to find that better life that Jesus offers. I still feel like I'm the same person. Don't get me wrong, Pastor, I love Jesus. Don't get me wrong, Pastor, I believe in Jesus. Don't get me wrong, Pastor, I love what Jesus says, but Pastor, I am stuck. And I feel like I am the same person I was before Jesus. And it's because we need to understand that when we come to Jesus, there are two opposing forces at battle for our life change. There is one uh, a, a force that is truth, that wants us to have life change, lasting life change, and it's truth, it's the word of God. And the other one is deception. Yes. Truth and deception, truth is God's way, deception is anything that isn't. Truth is God's way, deception is anything that isn't God's way. Total absolute. I said it from the pulpit, total absolute. God's way is the truth. Doesn't matter if you think you figured out a different way. It doesn't matter if another religion says this. It doesn't matter if it feels different. That is deception. It's a lie. There's only one way and it's God's way. And that way is the only truth. And life Though when we begin to live for the truth, we begin to follow God, life has this way, and I don't know if God orchestrates it that way, but life has this way of every day offering us a crossroads or a fork in the road. A fork in the road where we have to choose truth or deception. And it's not always easy to see the truth. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to wrap up with this illustration. It's still going to be a few minutes, so hang with me. Matthew chapter 14. Jesus, a little back story as you're turning there. John the Baptist has just been beheaded. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, Jesus' good friend. Uh, um, he, he was the last prophet before Jesus would come. And, uh, and John the Baptist has just been beheaded. The disciples have told Jesus that he has died. Jesus is upset. Jesus decides to go to a remote place by himself. And when he gets there, as often happens, when he gets there, the crowds have figured out where he's going and the crowds are there. And Jesus being a perfect person, he gets out of the boat. He has compassion on the crowds. He ministers to them. He heals them. He preaches to them. He teaches to them and, uh, and loves on them. And then he gets later in the evening, the disciples, you know the story, tell them, Jesus, there's no food here. Jesus feeds the thousands with a miracle. Then Jesus turns around and he says to his disciples, he says, guys, get in the boat. I want you to go out and uh, I'm going to dismiss the crowds. I'm going to come and I'll meet you where we're going. And the Bible says that the disciples get in the boat. They push out from shore. They begin to go out onto the sea and uh, And then the Bible says, Jesus dismissed the crowd. He went up to a quiet place by himself to pray. And then it picks up in verse 24. And it says this, But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. You know, these disciples, they're a lot like us. They've chosen to do life with Jesus. They have seen Jesus do incredible things. They have uh, been working hard to be obedient to Jesus. And out of obedience, they have gotten in the boat and and they are going to where Jesus has told them to go. And have you ever felt like, you know, I got in this boat because Jesus told me to get in this boat. I began to follow Jesus because I knew it was the right thing in my life. I knew I needed Jesus and I wanted something better for my life. And you got in this boat, Christianity, if you want to call it that, and you begin to follow Jesus, and you get out on the lake, and all of a sudden, everything is not as good as you hoped it would be. All of a sudden, it feels like the waves are bashing up against your boat. 
That, that, that description there actually it means that they were being tormented by the waves. You ever felt like you were being tormented by life? You ever felt like the wind was against you? It's like, ah, God, I'm, I'm right where I think you've asked me to be. I've been doing everything that I feel like you've asked me to do. And the wind feels like it's against me. I feel like everything is just, just tormenting me. Ever feel like that? It's like, you just can't get ahead and you're asking Jesus, where are you? Come on, God. I've been obedient to you and the disciples are in that situation. They're in this storm is rising up on the sea and the Sea of Galilee is not a small lake. It's, it's more like our Great Lakes is big. And uh, when we were on vacation, Betsy and I, this past week, we went out on this dock that, or it was a pier really, that went out into Lake Michigan and we were standing out on that and we were peering over and the water was very deep there and the waves were beginning to roll. You ever see when the waves roll and they're just big and you know, you got like seven to eight foot just rolling. And I thought, man, I would not want to be out on a boat out there right now. I would not want to be there. And my girls standing on the pier were like, we want to get off. We want to get off because it was, it, it was scary. And the disciples are in that moment where it, it's going to be a little bit rough for a while. And it says the wind was against them. And they got to be like, come on, God, what is going on? You know, I see this happen many times in my life. When I'm serving the Lord and I begin to make a decision for Jesus and I ask, sometimes it feels like the wind and the waves are against me. You know, it happens, I see it happen with people like myself with my finances. You know, it's, it, it, it's, I know the tithe works. That's not a problem. I, I, I'm faithful with the tithe. But when God asks me to give extra, like above and beyond my normal extra, that's always difficult and challenging, right? But I feel like when he tells me to do it, I get in the boat to do it. But it's a lot like, like Betsy and I are on vacation. We've tightened the belt for the season of our life for some things that we've been uh, uh, saving up for and then also for some things happening in the church. And we've been giving to these things and missions and other things. And, and we got on vacation where I want to spend money on my family, right? And I, and, and I have this budget for my thing. And we went to a church. And we get in the church and I'm worshiping the Lord and I'm loving Jesus and I'm in the boat. I feel like I'm in the boat, right? Like, Jesus, I love you. You're in the boat with me. And then Jesus says, I want you to do something. I want you to give. I said, Jesus, I already text the gift. Done. Text the gift. Did it on my way in this morning. Text the gift. Trinity done. He said, no, I want you to give here. I said, Jesus, I have so much cash in my pocket for this vacation. He said, yeah, but your checkbook's in the car. <laughs> and you see, you, you think I'm having this conversation and battling, like sitting in my chair, like, oh, no. No, I'm like this. Singing these beautiful songs about Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I want to serve you. You are holy. You are amazing. And I'm singing these songs like this. And in my heart, there is this fork in the road that's taking place. And I'm battling and I'm saying, no, this is probably deception. It's going to make me broke. This is not Jesus. And then there's the truth. And I'm... I'm just being real. And everybody in the church, see, look at that guy over there just going after Jesus. In my heart, I'm going. Mm -hmm. So I leaned over to my wife and said, I got to go get the checkbook. My wife, my wife's, you know, I'm waiting for her to say, like, what are you doing that for? Don't do that. Like, you know, why do you need the checkbook? And she's just like, okay. So here I got to walk out of church in the middle of worship, walk across the parking lot because we had to park at the back of their parking lot because we had our trailer. So walk all the way across the parking lot. You know, they're probably thinking, you know, the young man can't make it through the service. He's got to go for a smoke. And I got to go get my checkbook. 
write a check, put it in my pocket. They don't know why I went out there and I come back. It wasn't like an astronomical amount of money or anything, but then I returned home feeling good, you know. I got in the boat. I went where Jesus went, and then I realized I'm, uh, the mail is still at home waiting for me. And there's bills. And it's my birthday coming up, and that means registration, you know, the stupid plates on your car and the different things and you piles up and you go, how does this work? Like, wasn't there supposed to be checks in the mail? Not bills in the mail. And the storm feels like it's against you is what I'm saying. And please, I'm not asking for money. We're fine. We're totally fine. I'm just using an illustration for you. That the waves feel like they're against you and they're beating on the boat and it feels like, God, where are you? And perhaps you're feeling like them today. And it says in verse 14, or, or chapter 14, verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. See, sometime between three and six in the morning, Jesus showed up. You can imagine these guys, they're probably soaking wet. They're miserable. They've been rowing all night. They, they, they are probably very cold. And in that moment, Jesus shows up. He's the one guy who can change the whole situation for them. And he shows up in that moment. And understand that this is the same Jesus who had been on the boat with them before on this same sea during a storm. And you know the story. The storm came and Jesus was in the bottom of the boat and he was sleeping and the disciples feared for their lives and they run down and they wake up Jesus and they say, Jesus, we're going to die. And Jesus comes up on, uh, on the deck and he says, be still. And they look and they say to one another, who is this guy that can even calm the storms? That guy shows up. That guy shows up between three and six in the morning when they're worn and they're tired and they're cold and the very man that they need, nobody else on planet earth would have the power to calm the storm and Jesus shows up and there is the truth. There is the word walking on water. You see, Jesus is gonna show up. The word is there. The truth is there in your storm. It is there. But listen to what happens in verse 26. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Now, why is it that people struggle so hard to follow the truth, to follow the word of God? to follow Jesus in life. And maybe not with major decisions like finances and relationship, but even in the small things. Why is it so hard to follow Jesus? Because Jesus' ways are so foreign to our ways that it terrifies us. It terrifies us to follow Jesus. When Jesus says we're to love our neighbors, it terrifies us. Yeah, ah, that's so foreign. Just build a bigger privacy fence. That's better. It terrifies us. When Jesus says to pray for our enemies, it's so foreign. It terrifies us. And it might be the truth, but we're terrified by the truth. We're terrified by the very thing that could save us. When Jesus says no sex before marriage, it terrifies us. It terrifies us. You know, I remember when I worked at Home Depot before I was married and it was just a, about a month before I was going to get married and I had purchased a house and I was fixing up this house and, and, and word had gotten out at Home Depot that I was getting married. And somehow, because somebody had asked me, why, why aren't you and your, your fiance, why aren't you living together? And I had told them, well, you know, we don't, we don't do that. We're Christians and, 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 uh, and we don't have sex before marriage. I just, for some reason, told this person. And all of a sudden, all of Home Depot knew. <laughs> and you would have thought a ghost was working in the carpet department. Because <laughs> people had to come and see this guy. 
that is about to get married, is engaged, has a house, is young. Why is he a virgin? They're peeking through the aisles. They're coming up to me. Is it true? I don't know why. What are you talking about? Because it terrifies. The truth terrifies. The truth is so foreign to the world that it's like seeing a ghost when somebody lives the truth, when somebody walks the truth, when somebody puts the belt of truth on and makes Jesus the center of their life. It terrifies people because people say, that's not normal. That's not normal. We're terrified of how we will pay the bills with 10% of our pay going to the Lord. We're terrified when we are walking in obedience and all hell begins to fall apart around us. We're terrified. But you see, deception often breeds fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. And fear blinds us to the very thing we need the most in this life, the truth. It's Jesus. So often we talk about fear and faith, but fear breeds deception. Deception breeds fear, and those are contrary to faith and the truth. And it's one of the greatest attacks of the enemy. And some of you in this room, some listening online, you feel like those disciples. And perhaps you're in a relationship that you know is not healthy. And it's creating these storms in your life and you're feeling like the winds are against you and and they're not the wind beneath your sails anymore. It's, It's trouble. The one thing you need the most terrifies you and that's the truth. Perhaps financially, you're in this boat and you know you need some borders and some control over your finances, your spendings gotten a little out of control and debt is beginning to consume you and the bills are not being paid and you're terrified of the truth. You have convinced yourself that to change would change the way you live your life and and you're afraid that that life would be too boring. But the truth is you've really just deceived yourself. See, there's so many situations where fear of the truth blinds us to what we really need to what could really save us. We often then force ourselves to believe or at least act like we believe a lie. And what we do then is keep the very thing that can save us outside the boat. Jesus is so merciful. Verse 27, it says, but immediately, but quickly, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Holy Spirit's always quick. Say in your heart, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. But we still have the crossroads. And in all of our fears, Jesus is quick. If you put that belt of truth on, Jesus will be quick. Say, do not be afraid, I'm with you. It's me, trust me, don't be afraid. Every one of the guys in the boat were terrified except for one. One guy One man saw an opportunity at the fork in the road. One man saw this moment as a moment to put truth into action instead of shrinking back with the rest of the crowd in fear. And Peter said in verse 28, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. You know, I just learned recently that that word come there can be translated to mean to become like, to become like. Peter was not just asking to come to Jesus. He wasn't just wanting to be where Jesus was. He was literally asking that Jesus allow him to become like him. He wanted to do what was impossible with man and what was only possible with God. Truth will do that. Wrapping the belt of truth around your waist is to say, Jesus, I want to become like you. I want to see what man says is impossible. And at the intersection of truth and deception is a great opportunity for you to do what you never thought was possible. That's what truth does. Makes the impossible possible. Because it's God's truth. 
because it's God's law. Because it's Jesus waiting out there. Didn't you ever ask yourself, why didn't Peter just ask Jesus to get in the boat? Jesus, if that's you, come and get in the boat. Stop the storm. But he did. He said, Jesus, if it's you, let me get out of the boat and become like you. And so the question today is really this. What boat have you found yourself in? What boat have you found yourself in as you felt obedient to Jesus and following Jesus? What boat are you in? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's pursuing a business. Maybe it's it, whatever. What boat have you found yourself in that you're feeling like you're in a crossroads where you're saying, Jesus, I feel like I need to decide something today and I need to know what's truth and I need to know what's deception. And Jesus, if it means I got to get out of this boat to become like you, I'm going to take a step of faith and do it. And you know what? The truth is, every day, you might say to yourself, you know what? I'm not really at one of those major crossroads, Pastor. I don't have a major crossroad right now in my life. Things are going well. My business is well. It's, there's biblical principles in place. My marriage is great. You know, my, I feel like I'm serving the Lord. Things are great. I come to crossroads every day. I come to crossroads every time I walk past a piece of trash in the hallway at the church. I walk past a little napkin and I think to myself, somebody else will pick that up. And then this little nugget of truth drops into my heart from Proverbs and from John chapter, I think it's 16 that says, when you're little, when you're faithful with the little things, I can trust you with much. And that truth, I can choose truth in that moment or I can be deceived. And it's my responsibility to turn around, pick up the trash and put it away because it's God's nugget of truth. You see this, every decision, when I'm playing with my kids, little nuggets of truth drop into my heart and, and they're from God's word and I have an opportunity to respond to the truth or deception. I want you to stand to your feet and You know, I realize all across this room, every one of us, because we are human, have desires of our hearts and have pursued things in life, some good, some bad. But every person across this room, because we are human, whether we are, things are going great and we are in a boat and there's no storm and it's calm and we feel like Jesus is in the boat with us, we still have these small decisions of truth and deception. Or whether there's a storm and we feel like the waves are are tormenting us and the wind is against us. You know, all of us have those kind of situations in our lives. So I wanna give a moment right now, an opportunity right now for you to maybe you feel like you're just standing. And you say, Pastor Rob, I feel like I'm trying to just stand. I'm trying to suit up. Every week, you know, I'm putting on new pieces of armor of God, and I'm just trying to stand. I'm just trying to push back the, the, the attacks of the enemy. I'm just trying to stand, Pastor Rob. You're standing for yourself. You're standing for other people. You're standing for dreams that God has placed in your heart. You're standing for your business. You're standing for the unsaved at work. You're standing for financial blessing. You're standing. You're saying, God, Pastor Rob, I'm standing, I'm trying to stand, but it's getting difficult. It's getting challenging. We're here. I get it. We're human. I've had to stand too. It's not always easy. It's sometimes it's a challenge, and sometimes it's just encouraging to have somebody else stand with you. I'm sure the disciples looked around them when they were in the boat and were so thankful there was 12 of them. They were so thankful somebody else was with them as they waited for Jesus to show up. He's going to show up. He's going to show up whether he shows up with a miracle or whether he shows up with the answer that you need that is the truth that you can take a hold of that leads you out of there. Jesus is going to show up. You might feel like you're in the fourth watch 
the fourth hour, that time between three and six, you feel like, ah, oh, I'm dying here. I just need Jesus to show up. Let us pray with you. I get it. And maybe it's just a small decision that you got to make. I get it. Sometimes it's good to have somebody just pray with you. So we're going to open up these altars. Prayer teams are going to come and we're going to give you an opportunity. We're going to pray with you. Jesus, as these teams come and as people begin to fill this altar, Lord, sometimes this life that we're in is not easy. This life is challenging. God, it's a struggle sometimes to serve you. It's a struggle. And sometimes, God, to choose truth is terrifying. But Lord, you don't leave us out on a limb. You always show up and you give us opportunities. When we meet these forks in the road where we have to make choices, Lord God, you're there. You're faithful to be there. But Lord, to choose truth means that we have to choose to say, I want to be like Jesus. And Lord, that takes faith. So Lord, right now in this place, I pray that Holy Spirit, you would minister strength to people who have to make hard decisions today. I pray that you administer hope to those, Lord God, who got a, are trying to stick it out. Minister hope. And Lord, right now, I pray, Lord God, that you would bring the miracle. Lord, just as you walked on the water to bring the miracle to the disciples, would you bring miracles to these people as well? Miracles in their lives, Lord God. Healings, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for restoration, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for just miracles. Doors to open up, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for financial miracles. Lord, I pray for miracles, Lord God, because you are able. You are able. And I know you are faithful to show up. And in your mercy, God, would you be quick to do it. In your mercy, would you be quick to do it. Quick to show up, I pray. In Jesus' name. The altars are open. Come on and receive.